Hello and welcome to Frank's School. On this 118th day of the third year, I'm going to go back to uh, offering a kind of a gloss uh, to uh, uh, James Burke's work, uh, The Day the Universe Changed. His fourth episode is uh, called A Matter of Fact. Well, as a matter of fact, this is a matter of fact. His, he is so clever with his use of language all the time, and I'll show you before. And his titles are an example. A matter of fact. <laughs> Well, what's that mean? Well, we, we'll find out. Um, some things to point out, and I, I would like to be sort of brief if I could. The camera shot, the opening camera shot, is up through a wheat field, might be barley, I'm not sure, uh, at a helicopter, and then the helicopter. Tricky stuff. Science and technology. Now, he uses those two terms. Later on, I think it becomes more important to him that people distinguish science and technology are not the same thing. But at this point he, he just uses them it, uh, separately but he doesn't harp on it. Now he goes on to say that before 1450, well and that whole thing about how nowadays we do nothing completely ourselves, uh, everything is done for us. That's See, I, I almost immediately begin thinking about Wedge's paradigm at that point because that's what I'm talking about. That, uh, well, the decentralist manifesto, rather, and decentralism. He says before 1450, life was intensely local. Well, once again, that's, it was decentralist. I, I find decentralism lurking behind so much that uh, Burke says. We'll see, now that I have this approach to it, I'm watching more closely for it. Uh, now, he doesn't say this, <clears throat> but I, I had once decided that literacy was overrated. And uh, I decided that when I was in Brazil, because when I lived in Brazil in the Peace Corps, I lived in a world where most people could not read and write, especially in the countryside. Now, in town, uh, man, many could, but so many couldn't. And they got along fine. When they wrote their checks, they made an X, and somebody else signed their name. Uh, but that idea that, and why I say overrated, uh, they didn't suffer from not being able to read and write uh, that I could see, those people in the countryside. And, and I had begun at that point to suspect that they, <laughs> oh man, <clears throat> I don't know if I want to say that their lives were richer because they could not read and write. I'm not sure if I'm quite ready to go there, but Burke almost goes there. But anyway, that, that idea of literacy is overrated. I was so often tempted to use that in school because of its shock value, where, oh, teaching kids to read and write, it's everything, and you measure a country by its literacy rate. Well, you're, it's, there's a different way of looking at it. He, he uses the, uh, the term hearing and auditing. Uh, <clears throat> I just pointing them out, and the knife is a token, a token uh, as a way of recording things. Um, okay, uh, now memory. Yeah, he he said we had these incredible memories at that time. What that's what I'm talking about in a way, and and I he doesn't say, but I suspect sometimes that Shakespeare's work and his audience be, became possible because of that approach to language. Shakespeare's audience was probably mostly illiterate, and uh, probably many, many more people had these amazing memories. And uh, when they put those Shakespearean plays on, th those actors, uh, people don't t think about it very much, but there seems to be evidence that they learned those plays very fast, like within a week. Uh, they were ready to put on uh, Hamlet. <laughs> Now, I've known a few people, uh, or I know a few people nowadays who have amazing memories. We call them photographic memories, but they're like almost a fluke. Well, in any case, uh, and, and then some of this is hard to believe, what he's saying. It's hard to believe that somebody could really have a memory like that. But, but you see, it's, the mind operates differently. I, I don't know. And the word prosaic, well, they talk about prose and poetry. Prose is, is normal language with no literary devices, no beat, no, no, uh, you know, not, not, it's not poetry. Uh, and uh, pr prosaic can also mean dull. Well, he plays with these words. But he, he's saying that, that, that it was an oral world and life was poetic. Well, uh, you know, for me, 
I think about this. You don't you don't speed read poetry. <laughs> Why would you do that? Uh, and and the, I'm a slow reader. All my life I have been a slow reader. It was an agony, I think, in a way, at Harvard because they, they pegged me. They spotted me as a slow reader, and they gave me remedial courses when I first got there because they they sort of knew it was going to be an issue, and I think it was. That's the way I wanted to read. I didn't want to read fast. But it, it made it hard, uh, <clears throat> and people tended to read aloud. Well, when I read to myself, I, I read in, in my mind aloud. I think that's one of the reasons that I'm a slow reader. It, it just, it, it was a misfit, and yet I didn't want to give it up. I mean, may, that may explain an awful lot about the way I think. Maybe I'm still medieval, I don't know. The word uh, uh, illumination, well, illuminated manuscripts are these... Uh, Illuminated means uh, uh, brought, uh, well, see, if you think about illumination, that's the problem I have with this brightness here, it's the light. But illuminated also meant uh, decorated, when a manuscript was decorated. Uh, illuminated manuscripts, they're wonders. I, I can still clearly remember the first time I actually saw one in a British museum when I was about 23 or something like that. Uh, and I was just dazzled by it. Um, and, and, and uh, it's amazing stuff. Okay, uh, now this is just personal, but uh, the, at one point he's standing there and you can see a hillside behind him. He's at a monastery. I, I notice the vegetation on that. This has nothing to do with what he's teaching. But it reminds me of Portugal. And I suspect that that plant all over that hillside may be something called gorse. I was rather tickled with myself in Portugal that I came up with that word because I don't know if I'd ever actually seen gorse. But I think that that's, that, that's a derelict uh, pasture behind him. Uh, and I think that's what I was seeing in Portugal. Uh, in former times, that would have all been grazed in, in grass and, and, and sheep or, and or goats. Uh, that, you can just ignore that if you want. All right, finally, some comments about his style. He, he talks about uh, parchment. Uh, you know, uh, they wrote on, before paper, they wrote on parchment. Cost an arm and a leg. You know, it's the skin, the animal skin. The bind they were in, the bind they were in. He's talking about, he's holding books and the way they were bound. The bind they were in. And then news fit to pen. Well, that's an allusion to the New York Times expression, all the news that's fit to print. News fit to pen. And then finally, uh, I would ask you to go to the 19th minute. This is not hard to watch. It's amazing uh, to watch, but it's not hard to watch and to follow when he says small world. Right there, that would be a good place to stop. I was tempted to go further uh, uh, today, but I, I think that'll be enough. So I hope I'll, I'll give you the link in the description, and I hope you'll watch this and enjoy it. Bye for now.